Mm. All right. So, okay. So I attended the Plato's Academy conference on resilience on the 20th of May. And I've just, this is, was the running sheet. So you can just see quickly here, um, the, the speakers that they had, um, Nancy Sherman, who, and she's obviously a, um, uh, she must be um, advisor to the military, I think. It was aimed at the military. Um, Donald Robertson spoke on another essay of Plutarch, um, which was uh, tr on tranquility of mind, which was quite good. And I put up a quote from that on Facebook the other day. And resilience and scepticism. He was interesting. He did a sceptic view. Um, this other lady, I don't know who she is. Her, her presentation was very interesting. She was uh, a disabled person. She'd been living with all sorts of health issues. Um, and then this was the one from... Michael Fontaine. Um, then there was William O. Stevens, um, then a panel, and then finally Tim LeBon. But that was the one that caught my eye and I enjoyed listening to it. So I took notes. And um, so I just wanted to say before I start the, um, you know, over the years, sometimes I think, you know, I feel like um, I've fallen short a little on assertiveness with um, family and work colleagues and, and friends. And I think it sort of just jumped out at me because of that. And um, so that was the reason I think I was interested to go and read the essay then and find the essay. And, um, but Michael Fontaine has also written um, How to Grieve an Ancient Guide to the Lost Art of Consolation, I think, which is based on Cicero. And he did another one based on Cicero called uh, How to Tell a Joke, An Ancient Guide to the Art of Humour. So he's, he's, and this one now I think is based on the book that he's writing at the moment, which is about the Plutarch essay. Um, so yeah, I've only just read the article in the last few days, the actual essay, and, I was, and it was really marvellous, as I said before, and a rollicking good read. Um, so I think Plutarch was not only counselling the individual in this essay, I think he was sort of showing how it affects society as well um, in terms of I think how politics at large can be steered by this trickle-down effect of what, of what possibly are the seeds of corruption if people aren't operating honestly from a, a, a correct position of... of uh, of not, of not feeling too much shame and not being shameless in, in their attitude to life. So um, the essay has also been called Discourse on Voluntary Servitude. Um, and just a bit of background, he was born in 46 to, and died in 119 CE. And it, um, Michael Fontaine claims he was a Platonist. So I'm just going on what Fontaine said in this talk. Um, but he was sympathetic to the Stoics, and that does show up in the essay. Plutarch asks us if we've ever really done any of the following in the essay. He talks around these sorts of um, issues. Um, you know, have, any, have you ever voted or supported a policy that you weren't comfortable about? Or have you lent money knowing you won't get it back? Or have you given a letter of recommendation for someone that you didn't really feel was worthy of it? or have you procured an interview for someone um, in a similar vein, you know, someone you didn't think was particularly worthy or hired an unqualified person or lied for someone or rigged an award or a decision uh, or circled the wagons. I think that's Fontaine's um, um, addition there, but circled the wagons against someone or even said yes to section, not sure about, because he actually does go on a little bit about that as well um, in terms of the suitors. But I think suitors, not only in, in, the, in regards of, of intimacy, but also in regards of asking for favours generally. Um, so dysopia is the term he uses, which is the feeling of being pressured or bullied and the goal 
is to be impervious to this emotion. So um, you're aiming to resolve no longer to be slaves or to be bullied. Um, and the thing is that you are letting the bully do it. It's, it. You know, you're not being forced. If you're being attacked by a physically attacked, it's a different uh, scenario. This is where, where you are getting coerced and, um, and you're giving in. So why do you let yourself be bullied? So saying yes, when it is in your power to say no. So um, in other words, how to resist the act of caving in to an improper or inappropriate request. So the person prone to bullying gives an easy, is a pushover, is a people pleaser, an emotional, which is, you know, the emotional need to please others. Um, the peripatetics defined it as an oversensitivity to shame. So you feel shame in saying no to a request. And we need to calibrate our sensitivity to shame and be less susceptible to it. So um, Plutarch, pushes uh, quite strongly this idea of an appropriate sense of shame. Um, he talks about shame as not being a virtue, but just as a passion and getting the, the level of this passion in a balanced way. So not to be a shameless bastard, cruel and callous and have no charity and be selfish and also not to be a total pushover. Um, so this idea of, of, of aiming for this appropriate sense of shame. So he looks at it from top-down pressure, so from authority from above or someone in a position of power, and he also looks at it from uh, pressure from below, so generally um, or laterally, you know, from community and society. So in areas such as um, activism and pressure groups or petitions, protests, uh, this is probably Fontaine bringing this into a modern day view as well it, with these words, um, looking at it in, in the current uh, scenario of a, a modern day politics, uh, you know, to deplatform or censor someone or to green light a divisive initiative, any of those things where you may be pressured or coerced. Um, so bringing it back to Plutarch, he discusses situations where, um, because the, sorry, the essay is in three parts. So this first part, he talks about dysopia and he defines it and why it's not a suitable passion. Um, he, Gives, uh, gives examples, then he goes and gives his uh, recommendations and thirdly, then he gives his reflections. So this is the first part where he's discussing um, how, it, uh, how it happens. So for the examples he gives, uh, you know, when you lend money that you're not really happy to lend, um, where you are coerced maybe into, into choosing the wrong doctor through pressure from family or friends, uh, you know, for a health uh, to go to the right person or choosing a school. Um, he talks about lawsuits, being in court and choosing a lawyer. Um, he talks about even, he does go on further later on about juries and, or, or you know, the, where people are making a decision in, in, the, in the courtroom that would... Um, show that they've made a poor decision. Um, your personal beliefs, the way you choose your religion or identity. So that though, so he does give some really good examples also from mythology and history all through this essay. Okay, so his recommendations are, so he says, if you are toasted, you don't have to have to drink. If you think you've had enough to drink, you shouldn't have to feel like if you're toasted, you have to continue drinking. Um, he gives examples of uh, situations where if someone calls you a chicken or a coward, um, he talks about a game of dice, actually, uh, when they're all drinking and carousing. He, you know, he says, oh, you know, if you're, if you're being hassled to, to gamble or whatever, um, and someone's calling you a chicken or a coward because you're not joining in, it, it's just better just to agree with them. Um, if you're trapped in conversation, he says, just break away. Um, and he gives some examples quite funny of those. 
the, the, what, the examples of withholding applause are, <laughs> are very funny. I might try and find it if I've got time. Um, Michael Fontaine's example, though, he brings it forward into the modern day in the uh, arena of social media um, in that pressure to respond or retweet or share. Um, and then five, uh, saying no to irrelevant people. So, you know, people that are accosting you or want, wanting your time or, or um, suitors that are coming to you for, for requests and favours. Um, so he's saying to irrelevant people, just, just don't, just ignore them or just brush them aside. So always choose the better option, no matter how trivial, always choose the better option, uh, even in small cases. And work your way up from small, easy things to harder things. So, you know, like refusing requests for money or, or just as an example that he uses. Finally, he gives us 10 reflections. He says, um, this is a really good part of it, this part of the essay. He, he gives, again, many, many examples. One, um, caving in exacerbates problems rather than solving them. Um, he finds that silence is effective and um, he gives many examples where he suggests to give quotes or sayings and quips in answer to, uh, to sort of uh, discourage, to, to discourage the person that's um, confronting you. Um, he does talk for a while about this idea of the letters of recommendation, how to avoid um, or, or gives examples of where that should be avoided if you're not comfortable in doing so. He does say here, he goes on at length about regret um, is instantaneous. So you may feel shame in saying, in, in producing that decision to acquiesce and, uh, you know, give in, but your regret will be instantaneous. So there's no point giving in because you will then just feel this immediate regret. Um, and then number six. So then he says, okay, so you're going to get um, requests from people who are um, above you and below you in power. So from people below you in stature, he says just to use humour to decline improper requests. Um, and seven, he says uh, to appeal uh, for someone that's above in, you know, authority or power, he says to appeal to their honour or, you know, basically to guilt trip the more powerful person to, to, to appeal to their sense of honour. Um, number eight, he, he reflects on the fact that addicts are really good at resisting, <laughs> at, at um, not being coerced against their will. Um, nine, he uh, said to welcome criticism from bullies because um, really it just, doesn't make any difference just to let it go over you and um, laugh it off. And number 10, always that memory is the best antidote. Um, so memory of past, um, past experience, past um, times when you know that you may have fallen short of your, your better judgment and um, always keep those memories with you. Now, I've got here emotional memory, muscle memory. Uh, that might have been Fontaine bringing in some examples um, about those, you know, how memory can be um, useful. Um, the only other thing I have actually mentioned here was that uh, there were other translations of this essay, um, but the one I just noted here was Erasmus, and he called it Anto Antidote to Dysopia. Uh, wisdom and prudence enhanced, but there were quite uh, there was a number of other translations mentioned. Yeah, so there you go. Um, it's worth a read. Did did you get to read it, Ashley? Oh, he's gone. Okay. Uh, I haven't read it. No. No. Anyway, I just just it, it is a really good read. I, um. It's just, it's very entertaining. All right, yeah. there you go. That's my my um, my ten cents worth. Oh, thanks, Jody. Yeah, I thought it was an excellent essay, and it um, it highlights several things. I think, and one of them is 
Well, I mean, I guess the most obvious thing is that what Plutarch's saying essentially is what, <laughs> what we're also, also always getting told in our time, which is, you know, you've got to learn to say no, you know. And, and of course, it's true. But I think what Plutarch highlights is, is that the back, the back of it really is you have to have a moral framework before you can justify the saying no. You know, you have to have uh, a strong sense of your own principles, you know, mm. because that will give you the, um, the grounds on which to say no. If you don't have that, you're going to be more vulnerable to the people who will try and take advantage of you. Another thing I'd say too is that people don't necessarily try and take advantage consciously. That's the other thing. They, they just, some people just have it as a modus operandi. <laughs> And and you see that in politics, you know, or, or sort of mm. high high pressure environments. Some people, it's their modus operandi to uh, be always pressuring people to do this, to do that, to do the other thing. They don't see it as as moral pressure because, of course, that's what it is. And the people who don't have the um, the background set of principles, they're the ones who are going to be most vulnerable to being totally thrown off course, and and um, roped into things that really, if they had a, a, a firm set of uh, guidelines in the background, they wouldn't be roped into. So mm -hmm. that, just, that's just some of the reflections that come out of this essay. And yeah, it's just so interesting that, that he's nailed down all, so many of these situations that arise in the workplace, um, also in families, you know, in communities, uh, people, you know, exerting all kinds of moral pressure on for for to to get their own ends, um, and yeah, it's it's so, uh, or it can be so. Uh, well, so it it can really, you know, turn people's lives around in a bad way. People make the wrong decisions in that situation, mm. and and the consequences can be terrible. So yeah, I thought it was so fascinating. So thanks, Jody. Mm. Yeah, thanks, yeah, I Jody. just felt that I just think that the um it, it really may, you know, because he obviously is aiming it at the individual, but it it's so obvious that it goes so much broader than just the individual because you can see how um as it feeds down through or, or outward through community and politics, it, it's just going to, to um just create fertile ground for problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. I was just admiring um it's so similar to a lot of the modern kind of um, boundary setting stuff that gets taught in, in psychology. So yeah, I think it's interesting because obviously it would be really interesting to look at um, you can't, you know, the, the background of, of when, you know, when these early psychological tools were kind of used the first time, you know, sort of thing. And, and, and we've seen that with, Pierre Hadot's book where he talks about spiritual exercises but here you see a, a much more kind of practical example and that's that's really interesting in fact I, I actually haven't read it but I, I will read it and um, I look forward to kind of sharing it at the prison because <laughs> it'll be a kind of much more interesting take on it I think I'll really appreciate that um, so yeah thanks very much for sharing that you better not let um, what's that guy the um, the motivational speaker people, you would not let them know that um, somebody predated them and wrote wrote a paper on it because, uh, yeah. But anyway, yeah, awesome. That's great. So I was, I was wondering then, Courtney, like, I guess because you've studied personality theory and stuff for uni, it's like, you know, do you think that's more about being agreeable and disagreeable than people's moral framework well, I think that's what's interesting if you looked at it historically because obviously from what we have studied ourselves around ancient philosophy it's around moral belief and moral background but psychology has moved towards more uh, rights-based stuff and uh, individual difference and recognizing the rights of individuals and things like that so for example when they teach boundary setting that you're supposed to that you might teach children or women they have a shark cage technique that's popular nowadays and it and it's come out of 
um, the universal rights of women and children and kind of as the theoretical background for it. So as opposed to something like what we see here, which is uh, um, maybe, I mean, I haven't read it, but I assume something more grounded in, in, the, in the kind of uh, almost, it sounds almost Aristotelian, like a kind of mean, um, you know, average way of um, not behaving too extremely one way or the other. But I don't know. Um, yeah, is that helpful or not? So what's this shark, shark thing? Oh, it's just uh, the latest fad. Um, but it's pretty cool. Basically, you can teach children um, to use this metaphor that to keep them safe from people who wish to encroach upon their boundaries and you tell them something like this is the way the technique goes that um that the world's full of sharks and dolphins and uh they don't yet know how to discriminate between sharks and dolphins but dolphins will not try to get within the shark cage but shark cages i'm sorry but sharks will try to overcome those boundaries and get in and so then the children is to learn about um what kind of boundaries they would be looking for if they thought that somebody was trying to you know encroach upon things like touching them or you know um, making them feel uncomfortable things like that and apparently i don't know much about it but apparently the work is based around or the theoretical basis is around the universal rights of, of women and children or something like that it's um, it gets taught nowadays um so just thinking about it from that perspective uh, is quite different, obviously, than from this, this, this version that Plutarch's talking about. So I don't know much about it other than that. Yeah, so I suppose that, um, you know, what Plutarch's talking about in a lot of cases is, is with someone who's within a person's, like, circle or, you know, their social group or their... Um, yeah, or their milieu um, is 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 trying to pressure them on the basis of that connection. So it's somebody who is already in the in the um, in the circle, if you see what I mean. So, I, and that's where the um, the difficulty arises. I mean, it's the point is that not not just you know people who are obviously out to do harm, but <laughs> it's far more difficult when the people who are trying to coerce you are actually those who are within your family or your workplace or your um, friend group or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's, it's incredibly interesting. And, and so, um, and just so perceptive that, you know, Plutarch was, was thinking about these things and, uh, and collecting these examples from history and culture. It's amazing. Yeah, because you think about it, it's 1900 years ago. <laughs> That's what blows me away, you know, like it's... I think humans will always be the same though. Yeah, same problems. So Ashley, introduce us to, to what, what you've got. Uh, okay, I'm going next, am I? All right. So I'll do the screen share as well then. I, I was just going to ask uh, Jody, do, have you started using any of these um, techniques yet? You're on mute. You're still on mute. <laughs> the, the essay was uh, totally wonderful to read. I, I'm really glad he pushed me to find to find it from the talk that he gave. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just thought it was it was really good common common sense uh, advice in many ways and. Things we've all learnt all our lives, really. Um, you know, it was just lovely to see it put so succinctly and clearly and with humour as well. Yeah, it was good. Yes, yeah, cool. so I'll have to, I'll have, to, yeah. It's, um, it's not something I probably have as much trouble with now, but I just know that over the years I thought, you know, you know that we all do. We all get those situations where you, where you feel you should should step up or should help and sometimes you know you know that you're not comfortable about it or you know it might be against your better judgment yeah 
Try it. Cool. Oh, before you start, Ashley, I noticed you didn't comment yet about whether you've um, said yes to sex when you weren't sure whether or not you should. <laughs> what? He really, uh, he does. He really does give a, a part of the essay to how to uh, avoid being pressured into sex. <laughs> There's quite a, a you know, a, a good portion of of advice there. <laughs> I only mention it because Ashley's newly married. That's all. Newly married. Do you want to meet her? No. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's Diana. Hello, Hello Diana. <laughs> it's quite cold here. Yeah. Great. So I guess I'll go next with the presentation. So uh, yeah, mine's uh, it's uh, Eric Frome. It's the present human condition. So it's from this here. So just a little essay. It's like about eight pages long. It's your wife from a previous life. My wife from a previous life. Yes. <laughs> and I thought it was a good one because it's really short and it's just, it's got a lot of, um, uh, there's a few sort of key um, uh, ideas of Frome and um, it's, and it's also a good one for kind of tracking the development of his thought as well because it's just before you, release two major works. So I'll put on the, um, the screen share then. That will be... So I'm just trying to work this out. It's coming up, it puts the microphone on pause. Just before you say anything, I think I recognize Shannon in the third row. Okay, so is audio on? Yep, now it's working the audio. So uh, which one, this gentleman here? <laughs> Can't hear. Okay, anyway, so the present human condition, uh, Eric Frome, 1955. So here's just a little quote to introduce you if you haven't heard anything of him. Do you guys know Eric Frome? Yeah, they're all nodding. So I can't really see your faces while I've got the screen up. But anyway, so well, I'll read this anyway. Modern man is alienated from himself, from his fellow men, and from nature. He has been transformed into a commodity, experiences his life force as an investment, which must bring him the maximum profit attainable under existing market conditions. Uh, I'll give you a bit of a quick background on him and, and before we get into the text. So this is sort of where, where what his background is. Uh, does, does the PhD in sociology, 1922. While he was there, he studied under Alfred Weber, brother of Max Weber, and then Carl Jaspers. It's famous. I haven't heard of Heinrich Rickert, but apparently was the leading neo-Kantian of his day. And then after that, starts training psychoanalysis, um, starts his practice in 1927. And he's at this point in time, he's quite devoted disciple of Freud. 1930, completes his psychoanalytic training, and then he joins the Frankfurt School. 
he's there for uh, you know, it's 1933, he, you know, moves to Geneva and then eventually after that moves to America to the Columbia University and uh, becomes part of a neo-Freudian movement. Right, so his greatest influences. So this is relevant because you, you'll see it come through in the text quite a lot. So Freud is the biggest, then Marx, and then he, the Jewish prophetic tradition, which he studied a lot when he was like, uh, you know, a kid and a teenager, he used to actually be a be a teacher, and when he was a teenager before he started his PhD, um, I'll read you this. This is from the introductions about his legacy. He is known in the history of psychology as bridging the links between Marx and Freud emerging as he did from the Frankfurt School of Social Theory and carrying his work into the social climate of North American and Mexican culture. Um, so the importance, the critical importance of Freud's study for the history of psychology is its attempt to challenge the binary construction of the individual and social, uh, full stop, this tension <laughs> resides at the heart of a psychological theory from its inception. It is also something that registers how the human being exceeds the methods of natural science. Frome marks out the basis of the false distinction between social and individual reality, and it is this that underlines the continuing importance of Frome's work. The emergence of critical psychology since the crisis of social psychology in the 1970s and the introduction of post-structuralism and critical theory into psychology in the last 20 years asserts the importance of the political understanding of psychological knowledge. So this is what I think is so interesting about Frome is that he really, um, he crosses boundaries into different disciplines. And I think because of that, that's what gives him such a depth of insight that um like i yeah i just don't think anyone else really has and yeah you, you see this a lot in his like commentaries on freud um like a lot of his a lot of his work was was just like kind of correcting the things that freud got wrong because freud was just so stuck into um you know the things that he knew of his day and sort of late victorian period but anyway topic for another talk so what was he? He gets all kinds of descriptions, and this is what I'm talking about, how he um, kind of crosses barriers and disciplines. So you, you'll hear him described as a psychoanalyst, a neo-Freudian social philosopher, secular Jewish humanist, social analyst, Marxist humanist, critical theories, sociologist, democratic socialist, continental philosopher. There's all these different names for his work and, and what he did. Um, so yeah, I think once again, that's what makes him so so interesting. It's like what 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 like his his project. What was it? What he was doing? Because um, he just had there were so many different things happening. Um, so I'll read you this quote as well. Man is the only animal for whom his own existence is a problem which he has to solve and from which he cannot escape. So I've here I've just I'm sort of framing him here as an existential humanist. I think that is is the best way of of understanding his work and what he does. Um, uh, what's this quote? His theoretical acumen, <laughs> acumen enabled him to raise fundamental questions about the nature of being human and to locate such questions into the political and economic conditions of his time. With this critical analysis of the contemporary world and his far-reaching insights into the restrictive nature of modern living, he raised the uncomfortable issue of whether the social shaping of the human being did justice to the creative potential of human life. With his unsettling analysis of the conditions of Western society, he was a voice for humanity in a world driven by its own destructive and aggressive impulses. So I've, I've put that there. I think that, you know, some, some supports what I've said that he's a he's an existential humanist a lot of this as well come comes from his um his kind of like uh, uh Jewish background the, the in the um kind of prophetic tradition he was very influenced by by the the kind of end of days and a um 
new coming for mankind and all that sort of stuff. So he was very um, kind of moralistic and um, visionary about the potentiality for for, um, for for human beings on Earth. And it's it still has this existential undertone of it about, um, you know, we have a fundamental problem being humans and that, like, we need to search for the answer for, for how to cope with this. Um, so here you go. I've got to put him here. I think uh, he, he had philosophical insight, but I'd say above all, he was still a therapist and his interest was in improving psychic health and his insights came from witnessing real life people and situations. His work investigated emotional problems in free societies and advocated psychoanalysis as a care for cultural ills and as a tool to aid the development of a non-neurotic society. So this is why I personally wouldn't call him a philosopher myself. I think he's he's better, closer to being a um, a, a, a psychologist because he, he really, you know, comes from that psychoanalytic tradition. But uh, so, and for this reason, I think he's quite quite similar to to two people. Well, I, did, I was going to say Carl Jaspers as well, but didn't really have time to do a whole lot of, whole lot of research for him as well. But I said, much like um, uh, Viktor Frankl, you know, I've done a comparison, Austrian, German, Jewish, Jewish, psychiatrist, psychoanalysis, both interested in psychotherapy, work influenced by witnessing the horrors of fascism. Um, they both become influential in the 1940s for their works. Um, and then just a bit of a difference here in emphasis in finding life's central meaning. Uh, in finding life's meaning as a central human motivation was the big uh, contribution of Viktor Frankl. And I've said that Frome emphasizes social and economic conditions in shaping human construction. So I've seen the, uh, this is, I just think it's interesting that both these people came from such a similar time and place. And um, you know, these are probably the two biggest, most influential um, existentialists, existential humanists that I know of. So anyway, we'll get on to, I'll just give you a quick summary of this, um, of the human condition. So it's a short essay published in 1955, uh, 21 years after he moves to America. And he identifies the two greatest problems as he sees it in the beginning of the essay uh, with his new society that he's living in, in the 1950s. And he, he stresses the urgent need to resolve them by building a sane society based on democratic socialism that moves beyond a materialistic orientation to make the spiritual values of love, truth and justice our ultimate concern. So that's very short summary. And uh, the present human condition anticipates his next two major works, The Sane Society and The Art of Loving, which analyze the problems in further detail and they give a full articulation of his vision for how to resolve this, which is only just kind of outlined here, just the last two pages on the end. He just kind of throws out some ideas that aren't very well kind of articulated or argued for. So this, uh, yeah, it's just sort of, um, you can kind of see, because I've, I've read both of these before I read this essay. So it was really interesting to read then this before this, and you can kind of see the, you know, the development of his, of his thought come through in this essay. I thought it was very interesting, maybe just because I'm a frame nerd. So the problems that he identifies is the danger of an all destructive war hangs over humanity. Uh, and, um, you know, I guess it, I just find that interesting because reading it now, I was like, please, he's paranoid, you know, doomsday. Um, but then I think, well, 1955, this was actually kind of a real thing that people were, were very, rightly concerned about um, and you know so in that way this kind of places it in its uh, puts it in its time and place that 
that's such a big central issue for him, you know, that um, on that it's like on the backbone of World War II, he's so worried about the next all destructive war. And so the second problem, uh, man's character orientation. So that's another one of his uh, central ideas is, is he has this idea of um, character orientation that like um, the way that people adapt uh, to the economic and cultural conditions, they, they do that by having um, character orientations, right? So he says that in the medieval time, people were, uh, had a, a hoard, hoarding, hoarding and, ex, and exploitive character orientation, because that's kind of just what you had, how you just had to be to survive in those days. But now in the 1950s, Man's character orientation shows considerable passivity and identification with market values. So this, you know, as a someone deeply influenced by Marx, he has a really a real problem with the way that um, market values and and capitalism uh, um, has such an influence on uh, you know deep and intimate personal aspects of people's lives. This kind of man, modern industrial, modern industrialism has succeeded in producing. He is the automaton. So this is my new favorite word, automaton, that that he uses quite a lot in describing people, uh, people that he's saying they're alienated, but they're also unable to assert themselves. They just sort of follow the the daily rhythms of life without ever. Um, so not in this work, but in other works, he talks about um, living according to the um, active principle of life or actively participating in life. And so he says the, the automaton is the alienated man, the disconnected man who is not actively asserting themselves into life and not, um, uh, you know, how, how do you say, it? you know, um, uh, I know, I'm trying to think, grabbing, you know, grabbing the bull by the horns. They're just an automaton. And okay, so I'll tell you, this is what he says about the market values. The market system has reached out further than the economic sphere of commodities and labor. Man has transformed himself into a commodity and experiences his life as capital to be invested profitly. If he succeeds in that, he is successful and his life has meaning. If not, he is a failure. His value lies in his sell, sellability, sellability, not in his human qualities of love and reason, nor in his artistic capacities. Hence, his sense of his own value depends on extravagant factors, his success, the judgment of others. So this is a big problem for him. Um, that, you know, people are... Uh, you know, so much of their of how they perceive themselves that is being handed over externally, and it's according to the conditions of the market. Because he you know, he talks about how when people sell their commodity at the market, that's judgment day because they're being judged if their labors are being fruitful and if they pay off. But he thinks that you know a, a human that is not how we should perceive the value in humanity or in a individual is how well that they can sell on a market and that this causes a, a, a deadening of of the uh, of the you know psych he doesn't use the word solar you you know the psychic life or something like that um okay so what he what then can be expected from the future according to eric Frohn in 1955 um if we ignore those thoughts, which are only the products of our wishes, we have to admit, I am afraid, that the most likely possibility is still that the discrepancy between technical intelligence and reason will lead the world into atomic war. The most likely outcome of such a war is the destruction of in industrial civilization and the regression of the world to a primitive agrarian level. Or if the destruction should not prove to be as far as many specialists in the field believe, the result will be the necessity for the victor to organize a dominant and dominate the whole world. 
this could happen only in a centralized state based on force and it would make little difference whether Moscow or Washington were the seat of government. So he has a very big problem with centralization. And in fact, he also, I didn't put it in the PowerPoint, but he has another problem with um, not just market values, but what he calls um, another factor closely related to market function is the mode of industrial production where enterprises just get bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where the, he says that the smooth flowing of the um, organization becomes more important than the actual, um, the individuals that it affects and the people itself, that this entity is more important than the people that, it, that both it serves and who, who operate it. And so, so, so he thinks centralization is, is a problem because that's where these things get so much power. Um, and yeah, well, um, could talk more about that when it comes to what he says, because he thinks decentralization is one of the solutions to this problem. Um, so again, you can see it's very mark, um, quite Marxist, these sorts of um, attitudes. Um, and he continues, unfortunately, even the avoidance of war does not promise a bright future. In the development of both capitalism and communism, as we visualize them in the next 50 or 100 years, the processes that encourage human alienation will continue. Both systems are developed into managerial societies, their inhabitants well-fed, well-clad. So I'll just pause there as well. I think in 1955, I think people really weren't very aware of um, the kind of things that were happening in, because if he, I mean, he has in mind the USSR, and so um, to say that they are well-fed, well-clad, I, I think, uh, you know, like there was a lot of starvation and all those communist things. So I'm just assuming that wasn't sort of common information in 1955 or else he might have had a different take on that here. But, um, may, you know, maybe we can talk about that later. Um, so having their wishes satisfied and not having wishes which cannot be satisfied. And this is this is something that he says that this um, market orientation does to humans. He doesn't he elaborates on it more later on, but he's saying that um, the 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 market values create the character orientation where people only want things people or at least people only believe they want things which can be easily given right like hence advertising um, men are increasingly automatons who follow without force who are guided without leaders who make machines which act like men and produce men who act like machines their reason deteriorates while their intelligence rises thus creating the dangerous situation of equipping man with the greatest material power without the wisdom to use it in spite of increasing production and comfort, man loses more and more the sense of self, feels that his life is meaningless, even though such a feeling is largely unconscious. In the 19th century, the problem was that God is dead. In the 20th century, the problem is that man is dead. The danger of the past was that men become slaves. The danger of the future is that men may become robots. True enough, robots do not rebel. But given man's nature, robots cannot live and remain sane. They become golems. They will destroy their world and themselves because they will, oh, they will not, it's supposed to be, sorry, I forgot the word. They will not be able to stand, oh, they will be able to stand no longer to the boredom of a meaningless life. So this I found find very, very interesting. Um, and because I think, uh, you know, being that throne was so influenced by these um, Jewish prophetic tradition, he, 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 I think that kind of comes through in his writing, the way that he talks um, with, with that kind of um, prophetic warning. And uh, the fact that he, he references here that God is dead, that was the problem of the 19th century. And now that he's declaring man is dead in the 20th century, uh, I find that very interesting because, you know, it's like Nietzsche had a prophetic tone um, in, in his day and, and a lot of the things that um, 
he was concerned about from his existentialist point of view. I think, you know, well and truly, um, we could see that he was kind of ahead of his time in in looking at what happened. And so I just, I think this is very interesting, very, um, you know, right on the money here. So, but anyway, um, I've, we'll move on to the discussion section. So the, I mean, these are some questions that I, I thought that we we, uh, we could talk about in in reference to this text. So the first, I mean, do you think global war is still possible? Because he said saying he's made his prediction. He said for the next fifty to one hundred years. So it's now sixty eight years after. And he's, so is global war, war still possible? Uh, are people still becoming increased? alienated and feel that their life is meaningless even even more than they have in the you know the last 50 years are people transforming themselves into commodities are enterprises becoming bigger and more bureaucratic is there a widening gap between technical intelligence and reason yeah. or wisdom uh, he says this in the text as well that religion has become an empty shell transformed into a self-help device for increasing one's own power for success. And uh, is, is love, he also mentions this in the text, is love becoming an egotistical haven from loneliness? Mm. Does anyone have any thoughts there? Um, I could say something just because I'm curious. He sounds very interesting. Um, I haven't read any from and... Uh... And, but I have read critical psychology and um, I get the impression, not knowing this guy's work, that he's saying that there are larger social structures as opposed to say what psychologists normally focus on. They, they often focus on, on the individual as the locus of, of scientific interest, if you like, whether it be DNA or beliefs or whatever. This other approach, the critical approach, usually looks at the ways in which the historical or the social um, and the institutional and all that sort of stuff um, shapes the individual. So I'm yeah. getting, that's what he's getting at, right? He's saying that there are forces, um, whatever they are, these um, industrial kind of style societies. And it sounded like he was really referring to things like I think you mentioned um, capitalism, but consumerism as well, right? So people become um, shaped by that particular um, modern kind of world. And in being shaped that way, there's a kind of reciprocal kind of um, relationship that the individual being shaped thus then responds back to those institutions by becoming robot-like or an automaton, as it says. Um, yeah. So there's that deep interaction between the two, right? Is that the kind of thing that he's talking about? Yeah, I guess, so I think this sort of idea came from his, um, you know, critiquing of, of Freud, because he's saying that, like, Freud just narrowly focused on the individual mm -hmm. and curing the psychosis of the individual and he looked at it from a kind of biological point of view. But, you know, where, where Frome, because, you know, his sort of legacy was combining Freud and, and Marx, he, he believes that um, that society as a whole creates mass psychosis because there are conditions that we have to adapt to, right? And so a lot of... Um, a lot of problems in like a lot of um, neuroses that we have, um, you know, some things are individual and your parents and those kind of unique things. But a lot of the things that people have are just caused by the general um, economic and cultural conditions that people are um, adapting to and trying to survive in. And so he said that like he has, you know, one of his major works is the sane society and so he's talking about how we need a to if we want to help cure people of their neuroses we need to create a society which is um, productive 
for people's well-being, right? Or, or, or he talks about a you know a society that produces the right kinds of individuals that are going to be um, healthy, like a, a men mentally healthy. And so he identifies five different needs that humans have, and um, and then he he's um, God, I'm trying to think, and then he's kind of saying that like, well, all these different needs society is just not meeting them and in fact the uh, market values are actually hostile towards these needs so he says we need we have a need for transcendence we have a need for um relatedness um and so and you know if we don't have relatedness the invert the maladaption to that is narcissism uh, the maladaption and that's kind of the way that market values are driving us towards. The maladaption to transcendence is destructiveness. Uh, the next need is rootedness, any um, or or a sense of brotherliness, like um, in how we relate to people. And the maladaption to that is in, is a incest impulse. Uh, then I'm starting to flick through this chapter, trying to find them all. Yeah. Um, but so the phenomenological um, interest, I'm um, thinking of Carl Jaspers here, is that um, that um, you can't treat people as separate from their societies. So it's the society that shapes the individual. So it's looking at from the other way around, from what normal psychology approaches things. And he's saying that if you have a certain society with a certain kind of uh, unhealthy um, framework, it produces unhealthy human beings. In fact, yeah. they lose track of their basic um, healthy libidinal um, whatever urges, and they get displaced or they get changed, and they get and they get altered to resemble something that that fits into this automated kind of consumer um, robotic worldview kind of thing. Mm. Um, can and, I just comment on that? I um, I haven't read from. I have read. Adorno and Horkheimer, The Authoritarian Personality, 1950. Um, and I know Fromm was uh, closely involved with both Adorno and Horkheimer in the, in the previous years. And it seems to me that uh, maybe, you know, there's some of the, some of the same uh, issues in their approach to what, how, what, how they encountered American life as they came uh, from, as refugees from Nazi Europe. Um, so Adorno and Horkheimer, um, and it, it is quite extraordinary, seem to think, or at least said they thought, that there was the risk of a new kind of man, as they put it, um, an authoritarian personality, uh, um, you know, someone who is likely to follow fascism. And, and yet they did all these surveys and the actual results from their survey showed that ordinary Americans were not at all likely <laughs> to follow fascism. Um, and it seems to me that from by dismissing his fellow humans as automata is betraying the, exactly the same arrogance of the intellectuals um, simply because he found the normal inhabitants of America not to be, not, not to fit the pretty shop-worn prescription from Marx that, you know, every, everyone surely wants to be an artist in the evenings after their day's work. Well, actually, no, most people don't want to be an artist in the evenings. Most people, do, most people don't fit that intellectual kind of framework. So it seems to me very, um, very odd that, that, uh, that someone with the experience that, that Fromm would have to, to, to dismiss people as as automata you know if you know actual human beings you don't dismiss them as automata you know you you understand that they have their reasons for doing what they do and and that's the difference between frankel i would say and from since you've made that comparison ashley <laughs> frankel <laughs> saw humans and in the most unpromising of situations that's to say in a death camp and he realized that within that situation every individual because of their individual uh their individual 
personality, their experiences and their character would make different decisions. In the death camp, Frankel didn't dismiss all the people as automata. How arrogant to do that um, in, a, in a free society where Fromm found himself. I, I just find it extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, it's an interesting perspective. I like I, I happen to agree that most people are living their lives not according to asserting their own, um, you know, active will to life. I, I, from what I've seen, most people are just going with the flow and just living you know, their life unreflectively and just, well, I just go to work and then I'll come home and watch TV and that, yep, that's, like, I I think, like, I, I think people are increasingly alienated uh, and disconnected. I mean, I guess that's why I find this so interesting. Can I say I think that's interesting too? I do like that theme, and it's and I think it is an attractive theme to a lot of people. Um, and there's a part that you were reading out about the automatons and that that made me think of the Matrix that we become more uh, as individuals we get we get tra changed by these larger forces to become something more like batteries or units of production in that Marxist sort of language that keep that system going the way it is. But on the other hand. He also told the story about, he mentioned even the word golem, right? And I do vaguely recall that the golem story is a Jewish story. And apparently it's a it's a spell or a or a curse that was used to bring, you know, an inanimate creature to life. And just a quick Google of the story, I don't know it um, exactly, but basically it's the golem was there to um to save the, the the Jewish village from its tormentors or destructors. So in a way, it's kind of like, I know I'm stretching it a little bit here, but it's a little bit like, imagine if Fromm was a um, Jehovah Witness or something, <laughs> we'd have quite a different attitude towards it where he's resurrecting, you know, the values of his particular tradition um, over the obviously corrupt and mechanistic uh, values of the new society he's found himself in. So I can see where you're coming from there, Judith, and I think that would be a fair critique too. Uh, I guess he, he says he, he, his concern is that people are um, passive and identified with market values, which is about um, considering themselves a success or a failure based on their value in the market. And like, I, I think that's generally true that people think of themselves as successful or not if their job or career is successful and they, that a lot of people have their whole identity bound up in their job. And I, I see that as a, I think that's a problematic thing. And I do agree that people are very passive in general right like hence um no they're not that's ridiculous ashley what what grounds do you have for saying that what do you mean oh it's like what are we doing about global warming oh come right. on we, we're destroying our economy is is that enough you know we're, <laughs> we're 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 transforming um you know our, our economy to unreliable renewable um sources uh you know if that's not enough to to do it to um to address the issue, I don't know what it is. Uh, you know, I think that's an absolute slander on every on on normal people. Ashley, come out and justify I mean, why, why you would say they're automata. <laughs> Sorry, I've met a lot of normal people. So have and... I. I've lived a lot longer than you, <laughs> and the, and the more I live, the more respect I have for um, for normal people. I just think it's an absolute outrage on on. Um, on, on normal people for an intellectual to stand up and say they're automata. You know, yeah. the, people, the people that are being called automata, they're fathers, they're mothers, they're workers in the community, they're, um, they're caring, they're volunteers. You know, they're automata, really? Well, it's, it's a character orientation.
I guess the trick with this stuff too is we haven't read from, so it's hard for us to kind of know the theoretical background. But I'm going to assume, like I said, that rather than the individual perspective that um, uh, we would normally orient to, like a critique of the individual, he's talking about much larger forces that that basically shape us collectively. Um, so it might not be that the individual well, it's hard because we've got such a small sample here, but it might not be that the individual is guilty of becoming an automata because of uh, their own willing, so to speak, but rather that they become more, um, something in them is changed from his whatever perspective he, he, would, he would value, which is obviously to do with love and mystical values and uh, the creative in a human spirit or whatever it is that he wrote the books around. Um, and and that he sees people as devolving into some sort of uh, consumer creature type thing, but yeah, I, I think I'd have to know more about it to be able to kind of. I'm just guessing. I'm just trying to make peace, actually. No, I I mean I shouldn't have to apologise for my fervor here, but but as you know, as someone who is you know I, I live in books I live for the life of the mind but I also see that it's very tempting when you do live in books and you do live the life of the mind to think that all those other people out there well what are they doing you know they're not living properly well that's that's a pitfall and it's not something to be to feel great about <laughs> uh, yeah I guess I mean I just say it like because he talks about you know in the middle ages the character orientation was was hoarding and exploitative and well, that, that's a stupid generalization as well i mean <laughs> that's just ridiculous why, why would you say that well i mean in like medieval period people didn't have a lot so they tend to be very careful about there, there was only so much money, right? Like there was only so much gold to make enough money and the amount of production was, was very limited, which is, which is unlike today, right? Where, you know, you can, can have completely free markets and all, and all this kind of thing. So, um, so when, when people had things that, you know, that's their kind of attitude towards them is to kind of hold on to things, keep them, be very careful about them, be very selective about like, you know, who and how you share with and things like that. And then in order to get more, you kind of had to exploit people, right? So, you know, the whole, that's like what the whole feudal system is, is based on. Well, but, but that's just a gross, again, and it's a gross simplification. So one of the things that's most striking about the Middle Ages is the and and you know we can agree or disagree about whether this was a good thing or not but but the generosity of people and that goes from people from the lowest to the highest their generosity to the church now obviously some people were doing it to you know purchase indemnity for for whatever their misdeeds were obviously but in general um people were incredibly generous no matter how little they had that that's a you know so to say that people had a hoarding mentality was just is just a ridiculous simplific oversimplification and and this is and sorry just to I mean I, and I I'm not you know I, I haven't read from so I don't know whether that's a fair judgment of how he writes it but I would just say that to to characterize a whole age in a certain way is likely to be an oversimplification. Well, yeah, I mean, that's right. It is an oversimplification. Um, and he, he doesn't, in this essay, he doesn't really elaborate on what a hoarding, I'm, I'm just sort of trying to speculate on what he means by hoarding or ex exploitative. But I guess I, like, I mean, he could just be completely wrong. I, I, I'm supposing that his his thinking isn't that it defines people entirely it's just um it's an it's an there's an influence in the economic conditions which people will adapt to in a certain way 
And so for the people who experience those economic conditions, they're going to have some kind of a bent to their, the character of their personality will have some kind of a bent in some direction based on how they adapt to their circumstances. You can't know that without actually examining the text from the time, examining the personal documents or, or the actual events that took place. Why, why would you make that kind of blanket assessment without, a, without looking at the specifics? I, I don't understand that. So Judith, if I can step in here, Ashley, um, the the hoarding mentality is entirely practical and necessary. Just think of the story of the grasshopper and the ant. So the, the, the ant hoards when there's food in abundance so he can survive the winter. It wasn't dissimilar for hunters and gatherers and people living in medieval times. They, they couldn't count on surviving the winter. They had to put food aside. They'd die. The same with fuel, all those things. That's just the practical realities of the time. <clears throat> they don't have supermarkets going around the clock and an unemployment benefit if you don't have money from a job to go and buy food. You, you couldn't depend on having sustenance. Yeah, but sure, I get that. But that could be said of any period between um, you know, the Paleolithic to the present day. So why would you say it particularly about the Middle Ages? I don't know. Is there... uh, because, well, so for, for throwing it's because there's a, the change begins with the industrial in, industrialization and the yeah, and the industrial yeah. revolution happened half a, half a millennium after the Middle Ages. So, you know, we're talking about we're talking in huge generalities here. This is my problem. Um, but but look, this is just a, this is just a side point, really. My my point is. Perhaps, and as I say, I haven't read from, and I'm interested to read him. And I, I, after your presentation, Ashley, which I should have thanked you for, which I didn't, um, I will read him. But um, I just wanted to say what what experience I'd had with the Frankfurt School to date, <laughs> and it was it was this, you know, this this bizarre overgeneralizations, sometimes in absolute defiance of the data in front of them. <laughs> Well, so he, he actually had a falling out with the Frankfurt School and, um, you know, sort of separated himself from it. Um, they kind of didn't like him all that much there. Um, so he never kind of affiliated himself with it after he left. But, it, you know, he always sort of stuck around as, as uh, um, a, a psychoanalysis because I've, I've heard that as well, that about the Frankfurt School as well. They're, they're quite, um, they were quite, how, how would you describe it? Um, you know, they had their heads in the sky and all that. Um, just, we, just so we don't leave, leave time short for Judith too, but I was just going to say, just uh, some of those dot points there, if I may just have a quick, quick comment there on a couple of the dot points um, where it says uh, um, our enterprise is becoming bigger and more bureaucratic. Well, I, I would feel yes, you know, with globalisation and increasing, um, um, you know, digitalisation of our banking systems and our economies and the broad scale of um, the globalised um, approach to production and things like that you know it does it it's pretty big stuff and and that other one there is there a widening gap between technical intelligence and reason wisdom well that technical intelligence yes we are we are getting we're getting a huge jump in technical intelligence and hopefully reason and wisdom will keep up with it you know that's hope hopeful to that 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 will happen, but there is definitely a, this ever burgeoning increase in technical intelligence, and so you know how we manage that. And then, um, in terms of religion, we know we know that um, re religious practices are changing, and values in that in that sense are changing. Um, in terms of um, church attendance or or the types of religions that are emerging, things like that. Um, and the um, broad application of of self help, etc. So, so some of those points, even even um, 
because he's 70 years ago, wasn't he? You know, talk, talking about all this. Um, yeah, I just see some of those points now probably are pertinent in terms, it may be more so than they were 70 years ago. Just as a comment, just on those few points there in the middle. Yeah, great. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I guess we'd better move on. So I hope you enjoyed. Very good. Yeah, I'll have to read some from now. Okay. Um, looks like Shannon's a no-show. Judith. Yep. I'll just try and get up my um, thing. Sorry, I've got to um, share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Can you see my screen? No. Yeah, it's just black at the moment. Oh, oh, here we go. Okay. Um, so what are you seeing now? Uh, guide, the best guide to Rome. Oh, good. Okay, that's what we want. Okay. So um, as you know, I recently um, <laughs> traveled overseas and, and broke my wrist. And so I've had a lot of time to read and think. And, and when I'm in... Um, you know, not feeling quite myself, I often go back to comfort literature. And one of my, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. So here we have the very famous equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius. And uh, when my husband and, and I first went to Rome in 2012 with our sons who were in their teens, I, I liked Rome, but I, I thought I wasn't getting it. Um, because if you come to Rome after you've been to Britain, say, Britain's all nicely signposted and there's lots of free public toilets and Rome's not like that. Rome is not well signposted. It's, it's, uh, it expects you to do the work. <laughs> and then it turns out, as I discovered many months after returning to Australia, that the best Oh, sorry, just before I move on, this picture um, of the coast is actually from Crete, where we were recently, that my husband took. So this southern coast of Crete is uh, that legendary place where Odysseus sailed by and um, encountered the Cyclops in the cave. And it's also the coast where, talking of the golem, um, the Greek equivalent to the golem was the brass monster, the brass automaton, <laughs> who was a, a giant made of brass who walked along this coast throwing rocks at the mariners in the water, including Jason and the Argonauts. So that's what this coast is, just for the record. But as it turns out, the best guidebook to Rome was written as long ago as 1871 by this man, a man called Augustus Hare. And he wrote a book called Walks in Rome, and it came out in 1871. Now, Augustus Hare was a very very interesting man. He was a true Victorian English eccentric. His uh, autobiography came out in six volumes, <laughs> but there is a short version published called um, The Years with Mother. Uh, so he was a very strange man, but he, he uh, found his calling early in life. Uh, he got a contract with John Murray, the publisher, to, to do guidebooks, first of all in Britain and then in, in Europe. And Walks in Rome, as I say, came out in 1871, but this edition here is the 17th edition, so you can see how popular it must have been. It's a wonderful book. It, as I say, it's two volumes. They're, they're not, you don't put them in your pocket. They're quite big ones. And one of the reasons why Augustus's book is so such a great guidebook is that he doesn't just tell you what he thinks about the places. He tells you what previous people who've come have written about it. So in Augustus's works, you will see what previous writers said about Rome. So here we have Goethe, the great German. Um, he visited Rome. He was a great uh, enthusiast for Italy. And here he is painted in, in uh, outside Rome in 1787. Um, Germaine de Staël, who's the French author in political exile. Um, she was exiled by Napoleon and she went to Italy and wrote some wonderful books about that. 
Felix Mendelssohn, the German musician and composer. He traveled in Italy in the 1830s. Nathaniel Hawthorne, the American author and diplomat. Uh, and Anna Jameson, the English art historian. So Augustus gives you little snippets from what all these people wrote about the places that he's talking about. Oops. So I don't know if you've been to Rome, but if you've been to Rome and seen the Forum, um, you'll know that it's, it's a jumble of temples, buildings, um, but as late as 1850, and, and that's what this picture shows, it had barely been excavated at all. It was just, it was a paddock for pasturing animals. It was called the Campo Vaccino, which means the, the cow pasture. And so this area, the Forum, um, now it's, it's full of temples and buildings. The Cloaca Maxima, the great drain of Rome is there, but here it was virtually yeah, it was just a cow paddock. So that just goes to show what, how it was then. So other, other things in Rome have disappeared over time. So the, um, I thought this audience would be more interested in, some, in Marcus Aurelius. And, and there was an arch of Marcus Aurelius, a triumphal arch. Um, and Augustus here tells us uh, in the Corso, on the left where the Via della Vite turns out of the Corso, an inscription on the wall records the destruction in 1665 of the triumphal arch of Marcus Aurelius. The magnificence of this arch is attested by the base reliefs representing the history of the emperor, which were removed from it and preserved on the staircase of the Palace of the Conservatives. And that's now part of the Capitoline Museums on the Capitoline Hill in Rome. And one reads in the course of the unbelievable inscription in which the Pope Alexander VII boasts of having cleared the public way of this monument. So we read in, in Augustus here something that's disappeared altogether, the march of, of the arch of Marcus Aurelius. One thing we still do have, luckily, is the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius. Um, and Augustus tells us in the center of the Piazza di Campidoglio is the famous statue of Marcus Aurelius, the only perfect equestrian, ancient equestrian statue in existence. From its vicinity to the Lateran, so intimately connected with the history of Constantine, it was supposed during the Middle Ages to represent that Christian emperor. And this fortunate error alone preserved it from the destruction which befell so many other ancient imperial statues. Michelangelo, standing in fixed admiration before the statue, was said to have bidden the horse, come in, come on, walk. Even until late years, Augustus writes, so this is in the 1860s, and a special guardian has been appointed, appointed to take care of it with an annual stipend of 10 scudi a year and the title of Il Custode del Cavallo, the, the guardian of the horse. So that's that wonderful statue. So uh, the next, the author, uh, one of the authors that Augustus quotes is Nathaniel Hawthorne. Now, I don't know if anyone's read Scarlet Letter, which is um, Hawthorne's most famous novel. It's a wonderful novel about um, what happened to a woman who transgressed the uh, mores of the Puritan society of New England in the 18th, 17th century. But uh, he, Nathaniel Hawthorne was appointed American consul at Liverpool and he traveled extensively and he wrote about Rome. And this is what he wrote about the statue of Marcus Aurelius. They stood a while to contemplate the bronze equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius. The moonlight glistened upon traces of the gilding which had once covered both rider and steed. These were almost gone, but the aspect of dignity was still perfect, clothing the figure as it were with an imperial robe of light. It was the most majestic representation of the kingly character that ever the world has seen. A sight of the old heathen emperor is enough to create an evanescent sentiment of loyalty, even in a democratic bosom. So august does he look so fit to rule, so worthy of man's profoundest homage and obedience, so inevitably attractive of his love. He stretches forth his hand with an air of proud magnificence and unlimited authority as uttering a decree from which no appeal was permissible, but in which the obedient subject was fi would find his highest interest consulted, a command that was in itself a benediction. It's a beautiful passage, but he maybe goes a bit overboard. 
And in re reading, um, reading Augustus and about these uh, guidebooks to Rome, I realized there was an even older guidebook to Rome. And it was from the 12th century, and it's called the Mirabilia Urbis Romae, the, the marvels of the city of Rome. Uh, and it was translated into English in the 19th century. And this book uh, drew on even older guidebooks, such as the Itineraria, which were lists of destinations and distances to and from Rome. And another, um, another older guidebook is the Tabula Putingeriana, which is an itinerarium, but it's for the whole Roman Empire and it's got maps as well. But only one of those has survived. Some of the itineraria have survived in various places quite by accident. So in the Mirabilia Urbis Romae, we read, there is at the Lateran a certain brazen horse that is called Constantine's horse, but it is not so, for whosoever will know the truth thereof, let him read it here. And then from reading the Mirabilia, I then read another medieval account by a guy, an uh, Englishman called Ranulf Higdon, and this was from the 14th century, and, he's, and he reports a legend about a noble knight called Marcus. <laughs> and he says the Romane is made promise to Marcus, a noble knight, that he should have predominance of the city and a perpetual memory if he could deliver that city. So this legend grew up with this noble knight called Marcus that he was promised this, uh, this memorial, this statue, this equestrian statue, if he could free the city. So um, I think that's where I've finished. Oh, no, but yeah. But so what's really interesting, and this is something I'm going to explore a bit further, so you've got a, like a sneak preview here, um, is these kind of folk memories of Marcus that even though, and the Mirabilia Urbis Romae is so confused, you know, it's got no actual, well, it's got some real information mixed in with a whole lot of complete invention. So obviously through the, through the early medieval period, so much information had been lost just as so many monuments have been lost. But somehow or other, there was this folk memory surviving about the virtue of Marcus Aurelius that even penetrated through this fog of confusion. So I'm gonna write something about this in due course. And the, the Mirabilia concludes with this really poignant passage where there's this, this um, sense of loss, which of course there had been. And the writer says, these and many more temples and palaces of emperors, consuls, senators, and prefects were in the time of the heathen within this Roman city, even as we have read in old chronicles and have seen with our eyes and have heard tell of ancient men. And moreover, how great was their beauty in gold and silver and brass and ivory and precious stones. We have endeavored us in writing as well as we could to bring back to the remembrance of mankind. And so um, this, here in the picture is the column of Marcus Aurelius now alongside the Corso. It was probably located once in the Campus Martius, which is now vanished, near the Temple of Hadrian, which is now vanished, and or near the Temple of Marcus Aurelius, which is of course now vanished. And so these guidebooks preserve to us these, these vanished things about the greatness that was Rome. So that's it. Well, thanks, Judith. That was really beautiful. Um, I didn't realize, yeah, I don't know anything about that part of the world because you know, I've never been there, but um, yeah, that's quite intriguing. So I presume from that uh, story about the um, the fellow in the 14th century or whatever with the, the, the horse, um, the noble knight, Marcus, did that kind of give a suggestion then, maybe I missed that, that most of the story of Marcus Aurelius, the emperor, had been lost, and they just had this weird story around why the horse statue was there. Is that what? Yeah, yeah, because um, it's hard for us to kind of even understand how much had been lost by that time. So, and I think there's a bit of a tendency these days to say, oh, there wasn't really a dark age, you know, but there actually was. And, mm -hmm. and reading this Mirabilia Urbis Romae, it's so confused, like even kind of what we consider basic facts about Roman history are completely mixed up. So, for instance, it starts off with Moses. It's like, seriously, you start off with Moses? <laughs> um, 
but but there was this belief that Moses actually predated everything in Roman history and everything in world history. Well, we know that's not the case, but in the 12th century, they didn't know any different. And and when you think about it, um, and I did a little bit of digging about this. So the manuscripts of the Republican Roman historian Livy. So when I say Republican, he was actually in the reign of Augustus, but he was writing about the Roman Republic centuries earlier. Um, they hadn't been rediscovered yet. Um, the imperial historian Tacitus, his manuscripts hadn't been rediscovered yet. They would only be discovered 300 years later in a single manuscript, by the way. <laughs> so um, it's like there was this incredibly tenuous connection, which is which 90% of which had been broken. Um, but there was just this folk memory. And that's what's fascinating to me, that there's this, that there's some folk recollection about this great man who, who was Marcus. It's, it's amazing, it seems to me. Just on, on that same sort of line, like um, from what you've read, what, what do you think would be the earliest source of like the folk Marcus? Like, or like from what you've read at least? But, I don't know, Shannon. I mean, I think mm. so. Um, the earliest mention of the meditations, I think, is in the seventh or eighth century when some bishop um, gives his copy to someone else. Like, so presumably it was current then, but I don't know what mentions there might have been between that one and this um, legend in the 14th century. Uh, or, or even the, the one in the 12th, because as you remember, he said, the guy who wrote in the 12th century, the author of the memorabilia said, you know, people think this is Constantine's horse, but it's not. And then he tells a story, although he doesn't actually mention Marcus in the story, that the mention of Marcus comes a bit later. So it's also mixed up. But it seems to me there's something there, you know, there's some some weird recollection or, and, and yeah, it's, it looks as though the only reason that Marcus, that amazing statue survived was people thought it was Constantine, except that some people must have retained some memory of Marcus. That's interesting. Like, it's like a, uh, you, uh, I'm not sure if this is the case, but like whether it was like just a verbal history that was sort of understood by some. And then, yeah, but yeah. then it's quite funny, like as a history thing, that it's like, it survived because we just thought it was someone else. <laughs> <laughs> like like yeah, the, the, the luck of history to, to have that happen. Yeah. So um and if if we um if you remember that picture of the forum I showed, so if you, I mean the forum is just chock a block with temples and buildings now because it's been excavated, but for hundreds of years it was just a cow paddock. And but also there was a legend that um that there was an entrance to hell there because there were all these demons there. So that must have been a folk memory of all the pagan temples there. Um, and so that was a reason why there was no excavation for centuries. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just, it's kind, of, it's kind of depressing on one level that the extent of the forgetting, really, the forgetting of stuff, you know, the, you know and how, how easily things get forgotten and yeah. distorted and, um yeah but it's, it's really interesting too like what you're saying where that they had like this idea of demons being there and that's because yeah. it's sort of that there's there's like a community knowledge of like yeah. vague understanding of what used to be there and so it just sort of gets like warped and built upon it's yeah yeah but also as that um conclusion to the mirabilia shows you know there's like this vague nostalgia about the greatness you know there's a sense of of loss, really. There's there's an idea that oh, we actually did lose so much. Um, so yeah, it's it's all really fascinating, I think. Um, and that's why I love reading guidebooks because they they give this, you know, they just give you this sense of of what's there and what was there and what people thought was there. And yeah, <laughs> hope you enjoyed it. And so presumably, just, um, oh sorry, I was just gonna say, and presumably, I'm just. Um, Obviously, this is the case, but in presumably, and uh, the Pope, who it was Alexander, removed the oh the yeah, the, the arch of Marcus Aurelius, yeah, 
because it was a pagan arch, presumably, that was the idea. Yeah, I think he actually just wanted to widen the Corso, which is one of the main roads in Rome. So uh -huh. because his, his inscription said, you know, makes it clear, look, I was just doing this for everybody else, you know, for their convenience. It's like, oh, OK. <laughs> well, so it survived from the second century AD through to the 17th, and then he just got rid of it. And similarly shocking to me, having never been to these places, but only ever encountered them in my imagination, is you told me that that little stream or river that appears in the Phaedrus where they're wandering along. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Al you said they're concreted over yeah, it or something. Yeah. <laughs> That's in Athens. Yeah, I know. It's just so. And, yeah, I mean, I'm the kind of person who goes looking for all these, you know, things I've read in literature. and But, yeah, the... the um, the rivers in Athens is really sad. <laughs> um, and obviously a really nice thing that your story alludes to as well is the wonderful work that serious scholarship and academics has done for rehabilitating the history, of, you know, of yeah. these places. So um, if you remember that picture I showed of the forum, so the, the only bit that was kind of excavated was like one column. I don't know if you saw that, but anyway, there's one column out of the forum. Shannon, you've been to Rome, haven't you? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you might not remember, but it's called the um, the column of focus, and it was only excavated because um, a woman called uh, an English woman, the Duchess of Devonshire, uh, Elizabeth Foster was her name, and in 1816 she retired to Rome, and she had bucket loads of money and she decided she was going to do she was going to pay for a small excavation in the forum and so she paid for this section of the forum to be excavated and as it turned out this column of focus was <laughs> was one of the very latest um, items in the forum so it was from the sixth century AD and it was a, in honor of a very forgettable um, ruler that you know nobody really cared about but for um, decades, it was the only bit of the forum that had been excavated because the Roman authorities just had no interest whatsoever in excavating. It was just the Duchess had this interest and unlimited money, and so she did what she could. <laughs> but it was um, decades and decades and decades before the authorities in Rome realised there was a huge tourism benefit in excavating and doing it properly. So... Yeah, um, Augustus Hare, um, the, the guidebook writer, he explains what's there. But really, um, now if you go there, there's 100% more. This is so, yeah. one, of, one of the things I was thinking about. Like, um, and I haven't really looked into this. So I remember I went to, when I went to England, I went to like one of the Roman bars. And that had been, so there's like this different style of preservation that sort of existed where they rebuilt it to what they thought it should be, not what was actually there. Like, yeah, they, they were willing to like bring in materials and stuff like that to build it. And like parts of it were like really anachronistic um, to probably what was there. Do you think like in Rome, has that, has that happened much there? Like where it's not like, because it's so long since they've sort of restructured, like rebuilt some of this stuff, there wasn't that level of care of like details, just kind of like, oh yeah, yeah just. Yeah, um, that's a really interesting point. And we did raise it, I'm sure we raised it in, in chat in Facebook once. I think Courtney, you said about, um, was it the Great Wall of China or, or some site had been restored? Yeah, it's a whole issue around restoration. So not in Rome proper, but if you go to Ostia Antica, which is like a day trip from Rome, and that was the port of Rome in ancient times, in the 30s, Mussolini uh, had it extensively restored or certain parts of it. So, for instance, the amphitheatre there, which you go in, it's like, wow, it's amazing, but basically it was, it was redone in the 30s. So, um, yeah, there's a whole issue around, well, what's acceptable restoration, what's uh, helpful and educational restoration and what what should you just leave as is I think in the forum they've pretty well there's so much stuff there they've just pretty well left it as is but it but it is a um, an interesting question and when we went to Crete recently the um, the palace at Knossos 
was one of the very first sites which was excavated in the 20th century. And Arthur Evans, who was the archaeologist, uh, organised for these some, some restorations. Now, I, before going there, I thought they would probably be pretty intrusive and maybe in poor taste and, you know, just a bit jarring. I actually found they were really good. And there's a school of thought, apparently, we were told, um, among archaeologists that a certain amount of restoration, if it's done carefully and tastefully, is actually really good at giving people an idea of what the site must have looked like. Because otherwise, what are you left with? You're left with some boulders and walls. I mean, essentially, that's what you've got nine times out of ten. And that's not very, not very educational and it's not very engaging. Whereas at Gnosis, um, so what happened was they took the, uh, the famous wall paintings at Gnosis and they're now in the museum in Heraklion, the capital city, but they've put reproductions back at the site. And I think that actually works really well. So I think it's probably on a case by case basis. I'm sure there are cases where it's been done in poor taste in various locations, but from what I've seen in Gnosis, um, Ostia Andica, I haven't really seen it done in a way that I would say was really um, in poor taste or poor judgment. So do you, do you think then they should paint marble statues? <laughs> Um, I don't know, Ashley. What do you think? Maybe uh, not originals, because if you, well, I suppose you could just strip the paint off if you fucked it up. <laughs> yeah, that's but a good people. People like them unpainted better, doesn't it? It makes it look more exotic. But and ultimately, you're never going to know what colours they used in the first place. Uh, we do have an idea so because there's traces of paint on some of them. So I think I think on some of them we do have a pretty good idea. I think it would be quite confronting, but I don't actually see a problem. I, I mean, I don't think they should go around and, you know, paint them everywhere, but, but I don't see a problem with showing what it would have looked like. I mean, it'd be, it'd be cool on replicas. Mm. You know, I just think with, with an original, if you, if you mess with it, and you can't undo it. It's like people trying to touch up the Mona Lisa. Yeah, isn't it? There's been so many of those that are just a disaster, aren't there? So the potential for getting it wrong is is high. <laughs> Put it that way. The um, topic of digging things up is always an interesting one because um, Vincent would know this too and probably you other guys do. But if you ever go over to China, there's a... The ancient capital is Xi'an, and uh, it's where the terracotta warriors are that you can go and see. And, um, you know, it's a really good dig site. Um, I think it got destroyed at one point. Um, get grave robbers came in and whatever. But still, as you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of these statues that are there, all these um, emperors, warriors. But long story short, the, the actual resting place of the emperor is known to them you drive past it it's a hill but they've refused to ex excavate it they won't dig it up and i'm not 100 sure what the reason is i've heard they're worried that um gases could get in and damage things or whatever but i'm sure they've got the technology around avoiding that i think part of it is um vincent can probably verify this but they don't want to dig it up because they have a different sense of uh respect that and and they kind of contrast it with us westerners who go and dig up all these dead people who are supposed to stay their spirit undisturbed and all the rest of it for the rest of eternity but for them they have this sense of deep respect and they think that, well, the emperor was this great man, you know, his name was Qin Shu Huang. He was, he was the guy who built the part of the wall and, and uh, he deserves to have his uh, resting place unmolested, basically. So hence they don't dig it up. Um, it's just interesting how different cultures approach mm. these sort of issues. Yeah, that's really interesting. Did you want to comment on that, Vincent, or...? You're on mute. Oh, you're, you're off mute now, but we can't hear you still. That's because I'm not speaking. Yeah. Oh, um, sorry. 
<laughs> um, yeah, no, nah, I went to Sion and it is pretty uh, pretty epic. Reminds me of the old Vikings, how they used to bury um, people in boats and stuff. They used to kill their slaves and stuff, livestock. Um, what's crazy too, and this is a bit of a cynical thing on it, it really flies counter to all the respect Courtney said with um, traditions and whatnot. But um, when you go there, they have these massive kiln factories where they're just churning out terracotta warriors. So there, there, there might be an alternative theory that they haven't uncovered all of it because they're still making um, things to put in the ground. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, that guy was a bastard, the emperor that um, Courtney's referring to. People were buried alive in the Great Wall of China. They worked to death and they just put their skeletons or their corpses in there. So supposedly it's haunted. But um, yeah, just a couple of cynical comments there. Uh, what did that stem from, Courtney? We were, were we going uh, old stuff. No, my point I, is that we dig up um, dead bodies left, right, and centre. You know, we went to ancient Egypt or whatever and hoist them out of the ground. But there's this idea that obviously the Chinese have that it's inappropriate to unearth these dead bodies. Perhaps. Yeah, New Zealand too. The um, Maori people, their tapu, their land is sacred. You can't go there. And I think Indigenous Americans, perhaps potentially. Um, I wanted to talk about something else for a moment, which is um, I haven't been to Italy. Um, thank you for a very interesting, um, it's certainly on the on the top of my bucket list now after that one, Judith. So um, I have been to Angkor Wat, which I highly recommend in Cambodia. And the worst thing about it there, which I'm sure is true of Italy and other places is other people. So I'm kind of thinking with technology, two things on that. One reminds me of a Black Mirror uh, episode where they have these kind of ocular implants that just uh, remove people from your vision. I think you could have a temporary thing with glasses. Now, it wouldn't work too well if people were moving around because they'd clobber into each other. But if you had these sorts of glasses and you were in Angkor Wat or you were in Venice or wherever uh, in Rome, and then you pop them on and then everything disappeared. But I would go one step while you were, while you were moving. They were deactivated when you moved, so you didn't hit anyone. But I really think too that um, with VR technology, you could have an experience that would be better in a certain way. Like, for instance, if you visited the pyramids and you had a VR set on, well, you actually wouldn't need to physically go there, but you could see the pyramids being built. So all these historians and technicians, they could do a rendering of that. And when you talk about reconstructing things that, um, you know, succumb to barbarians or earthquakes, then I'm sure that they would know what it actually um, how these things were formed, how they were built, like some of the massive cathedrals. I think they took more than one lifetime to construct. So if you were a worker on that thing, you'd only know it with scaffolding on the whole time, potentially, that sort of thing. But if you did have that VR technology so that you could visit these places, there's no other tourists, and you can choose what you can go back in time to see them being built. If you were to go to those places as well, it would be even more uplifting, you know? because you could see what remains of the day now and be able to see, turn back the clock and see where the, uh, for, was it the forum with all the animals and stuff? And then see, you know, the pagan, the pagans partying in the streets and all that. So um, yeah, but Xi'an's also, it's a great place to visit. It's pretty crazy. They have this theater you go into um, and it's, it's like a, it's like a big ring. The, the, the screens are right, 360 it's not a dome exactly and you're in the middle of this pitched battle so you'll see a knight charging towards you and then he disappears and if you turn 180 degrees he's you see the back of him charging into the fray it's pretty cool yeah so i'll actually go ahead and mute now i think um that idea with the the virtual reality would be interesting but probably I wonder what Judith would think about that. But but I'm curious if if the, the Great Wall is not actually the Great Wall anymore, because as we said, it's replaced brick, brick by bit brick. And same with the ship of Theseus or whatever, you know, you replace board by board, it's no longer the same ship. Well, we might as well just watch it on virtual reality then, right? I don't know. So how how typical would you say Rome is for a you know pre-former ancient? city sorry what modern, how what do you think it is actually i didn't catch what typical. how typical yeah 
As in what way? Well, as far as like, you know, um, forgetting all the history and then people rediscovering it and oh, having well, a weird kind of relationship to it. Well, I think, I mean, the point about Rome is it was the centre of the world and still people forgot about the stuff that happened there. That's the horrifying thing, you know. Um, somewhere like Lyon or Paris or or Aquileia or London or York, well, they weren't the centre of the Roman world, but even at the centre of the Roman world, they forgot about what happened. That's that's the um, that to me is the kind of the terrifying thing that that can happen. People can forget about so much. But but as for other places, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't really comment on non-European kind of centres. And well, I mean, you went to Athens, right? Well, I mean, Athens is even more kind of because Athens really underwent a dark age from, you know, or Greece underwent a dark age really from late Roman times again through, and then, the, um, I mean. Because I, I mean, I, the impression I get of um, Greece in general is like they don't really care that the, the all the um, ancient stuff, I mean, I could be, I don't know if I'm just completely wrong, but so far the impression I've got is like, they're just not really that interested in um, those, all that sort of stuff that sort of happened there. And oh, yeah, they're totally interested, actually. They're, they're completely, they? you know, they're totally, yeah, I don't know how you could have got that impression. Uh, I, was, I don't can't remember, it was something I must have watched. I mean, in a sense, for 2,000 years, all they've had is their memories of greatness. That's, that's kind of sustained them through war and oppression and the Ottoman Empire and everything, <laughs> is the memory of, of once war warriors, that kind of thing. Because in like the, the culture became completely Christianized, I guess. Like yeah. they, so like, the, like culturally, um, the, I don't, you know, we like, they the east you know eastern orthodox thing was was quite different well that but they thought of it as the same so that in in the eastern empire they called themselves the romans interestingly enough the room the, the rumi they called themselves the romans even though essentially they were the greek orthodox so they in the east they considered themselves the heirs of rome right so they consider themselves as as um as maintaining the, you know, civilization while, while the, the West had its dark ages. Do you reckon, um, I didn't want to interrupt, but uh, will we have time for me to go through my presentation? Yes, thing? please. Yes, do. I, um, I changed what I was going to do. So I did, I, I instead did a summary of a book, Benoli's Fallacy. But yeah, I didn't want to interrupt because it was a good conversation. It was interesting. Uh, Sure. Okay. All right. Is that showing all good? Hope so. Right, cool. So I've got uh, the Dulles Fallacy. It's by Aubrey Clayton. Uh, so basically what this book is arguing for is a, a Bayesian understanding of statistics, which I'll sort of go through like, what that actually means or why it sort of matters uh, through this presentation. So they sort of divide it up in two ways. they got the, uh, the author divides it. So you've got the frequentist, it's like the sampling probabilities. So you go from the hypothesis to the data. So given an assumption, what will we observe and how often? And then inferential probabilities. Uh, you go from the data to the hypothesis. So given what we observed, what can we conclude and with what certainty? So yeah, this is sort of just giving an example of it. So the frequentist position, they've got the uh, hypothesis and they're going to the data. So uh, the Bernoulli, like it was called Bernoulli's fallacy. He, uh, Jacob Bernoulli was a mathematician around like died in uh, 1705. 
And so he did a lot of major works in probability. Uh, one of the things he worked on is this idea of like, how do we get, uh, how do you um, take out pebbles? Uh, and what assumptions can you make about the ratio of black and white pebbles in there? So the difference would be with the frequentist, they'll be given a hypothetical mix of pebbles in the urn. Um, what's the probability of getting a data sample of white out of N? But then that compared to the Bayesian position, um, given an observed data sample of white out of N, the probability of the mix of pebbles in the urn uh, is going to be some amount. So what the author is arguing for is that the problem with Bernoulli's answer is he's got the arrow pointing the wrong way. He's already got the hypothesis and then uh, he's working towards like what's the data going to be? How does that fit into the data rather than letting the data define the hypothesis? So he's sort of uh, answering the wrong type of question. And so that confusion uh, around this point, that going from the hypothesis to the data, but assuming that you can then transfer this, the data to the hypothesis is what the author is trying to uh, undermine an attack is calling the Bernoulli's fallacy. Um, also sort of goes in that like they are, the sampling probabilities are more attractive because they're a lot easier from an educational perspective, because it's always, um, there's always a right answer so in that way, it's a lot more direct. It's a lot more easier to mark um, an exam or an assignment or something like that. Um, but it just doesn't work well in the real world. Now, in the book, he's probably not the nicest to the uh, frequentists. So I made this little comic thing. But basically, uh, frequent statistics is useful as the brain dead position. Um, he, so there was this quote that I sort of had from him where he goes, uh, these methods are not wrong in a minor way in the sense that Newtonian physics is technically just a low velocity constant gravitational approximation to the truth, but still allows us to successfully build bridges and trains. They are simply and irredeemably wrong. They are logically bankrupt with severe consequences for the world of science that depends on them. As some areas of science have become increasingly data and statistics driven, these foundational cracks have begun to show in the reform of the uh, reproducibility crisis, threatening to bring down entire disciplines of research. At the heart of the problem is a fundable, uh, fundamental misunderstanding of the quantification of uncertainty, that is probability, and its role in drawing inference from the data. He also talks about how this is a um, a wartime propaganda pamphlet that the he says uh, like that the statistics wars are, are not over and like, this is something that needs to be resolved and it probably would be one it's a very um it's it's not the easiest of reads but for the subject matter it, it's relatively easy like it's like a um if we're talking like philosophy it's like sort of a um reasonable level like summary of a um of a, a like more technical philosopher. So he's, the, the author is really influenced by uh, Edwin James, who wrote Probability Theory, The Logic of Science. And basically uh, James died before he could finish the work. So originally probability theory was meant to be a relatively easy work, but because James never got around to finishing it, it, it actually became very technical um, in terms of like what it had in it. Uh, so he's drawing a lot on that work to write this book. Um, but the, just to go back, like, because he is like very rhetorical in it, it makes it nice and easy to read, but it does sometimes make some of the things he says a bit questionable on like, is he being a fair share shake of like, and I'll get to some of the things I think are funny, but uh, are interesting, but I'm not sure if they actually help his argument. Um, so just an example of like why this matters like uh, this example of Sally Clark. So she was wrongfully convicted of murdering her two uh, infant children. So she gave birth to a baby boy in uh, September 96 and they died three months later. Um, so she had been alone and claimed that he'd fallen unconscious and stopped breathing uh, shortly after being put to bed. Then in November 1997, 
uh, gave birth to another boy, and they also died eight weeks later in similar circumstance. So notably, the, the second infant showed signs of trauma, which uh, Sally Clark explained as likely caused uh, by her attempts to uh, resuscitate him before the paramedics arrived, or that it might have been occurred uh, from the paramedics themselves when they attempted to resuscitate them. So both herself and her husband were arrested uh, in February uh, 98. Um, but the charges were dropped against the husband and she went to trial. So they had uh, Roy Meadow, who was the inventor of the term uh, Munchenhausen syndrome by proxy, uh, actually gave uh, expert testimony during her trial um, that the chance of the two children dying from SIDS was around one in 73 million. And during the trial, he compared it to um, the similar chance to an 80 to one horse uh, winning four years in a row in the a grand national horse race. And uh, later, after the trial, in a book he wrote uh, called ABC of Child Abuse, uh, one sudden infant death in a family is a tra uh, tragedy, two is suspicious, and three is murder unless proven otherwise. So she was a a sentenced to uh, life in prison. Um, her husband uh, was a solicitor, so he, he oh, as was she, um, and he actually actually quit his, his job to just focus uh, on her appeal. And they found that there had been evidence that had been withheld from the jury, uh, specifically that a test for a, a bacterial infection, I'm going to try to say this word, cerebrospinal fluid had come back positive, and that hadn't been reported during the, during the trial by the pediatrician. So um, that was one of the key reasons. But one of the other things that also came out of that was that the um, judge criticized the road better for his treatment of the statistics and how it was used in the trial. Um, cause he made an assumption that it was, um, independent and there was no, uh, like causal relation between the two deaths, but you know, that could have been from genetics or, um, what it probably turned out to be, it was environmental factors, um, causing a bacterial infection. And that those um, those factors that would increase the chance of SIDS was not um, he didn't really consider when he gave that one in seventy three million. So the um, uh, yeah, so he was sort of uh, only, but the statistician was only focused on the sampling probability of a given event. The, but the event of two apparently otherwise healthy children in the same family suddenly dying in infancy when he should have uh, considered the inferential probability for his hypothesis that the two children had been murdered. So he was sort of looking at, it wasn't looking at the chance and the language around this is really subtle and um, it, it's hard to, to say it somehow, but like he was looking at the chance of the children the two children dying versus but it should have been looking at the chance of them being murdered. It's like a subtly different worded thing, but it's sort of the same. Uh, so sadly, she died of alcohol poisoning in 2007. Um, so it would have been, I think about five years. So she was three years in, uh, in jail. So it would have been, yeah, about five years or so after she got out. So this is also called the prosecutor's fallacy that under an assumption the, uh, the suspect is innocent, the facts of the case would be incredibly unlikely. And therefore, the suspect is unlikely to be innocent. So that's like sort of a faulty leap. And this is something the author takes an example as the Bernoulli fallacy. Now, another good one is the base rate neglect. He also views this as being an example of Bernoulli's fallacy. So this is if you have a drug test to check if someone has drugs, like illegal drugs in their system. So imagine like a population. So uh, in this population, we're making an assumption that 10% of people use drugs. So if you get, if someone gets back a, a positive test, this test has a 90% accuracy in that the, um, out of the drug users, it will get nine, nine times out of 10, it's true. But 
in the larger population, you actually end up with a 50% uh, chance that if someone has a, a, a positive drug test, there's a 50% chance that they are actually a drug user. Now, this is interesting um, for a lot of reasons, like, especially like if you have something like welfare, like where, uh, say, as a requirement of welfare, uh, drug tests have to be performed, even something which is uh, fairly accurate, like 90%, that's pretty good. Um, it's, if there's a low number uh, of the welfare recipients that actually use drugs, um, then you're going to end up with this a, a bit of counterintuitive thing where the drug test is 90% accurate, but in the real world, it's actually only a 50-50 chance that that person is actually someone that uses drugs. So like the error occurs because we're taking the test result uh, given the welfare's drug use rather than considering the probability of the welfare, what their welfare drug use is given the test results. So it's this thing again, where it needs to be looking at the data, taking the data to then draw the hypothesis. Now, this is one of my, I found this really interesting because I like obviously part of this group, I do like history to some extent. Um, so he sort of goes through a lot of examples of the racism within the frequentist, um, camp um, and I probably thought more the, the, re the reason why I include this is because I just thought it was funny because uh, I thought of the slide the frequencies are not racist but um, but some of the comments I thought were quite interesting from one of the leading developers of frequentism uh, Pearson so uh, so uh, one of the, the interesting things is like the Jewish population so they had a lot of uh, Jewish immigrants coming in uh, you know, there's something going on in Germany around around that time. It wasn't a great time to be uh, to be Jewish. And uh, there was this quote from uh, yeah, Pearson, who was sort of a, one of the leading people within frequentism. He's taken on the average and regarding both sexes, this alien Jewish population is somewhat inferior physically and mentally to the native population. But we have to face the facts. We know and admit that some of the children of these alien Jews from the academic standpoint have done brilliantly. Whether they have the staying power of the native race is another question. No breeder of cattle, however, would purchase an entire herd because he anticipated finding one or two fine specimens included in it. So, you know, lovely guy. Um, then there was also, uh, he subjected the Jewish children to several medical exams without their consent. And he found that they had surprisingly healthy neck glands which could indicate uh, that they were more resilient to uh, tuberculosis. So being the objective scientist that he was, uh, he then went, well, this just shows that uh, with no justification on his part, that this just shows that uh, Jewish families are more likely to be weak minded and immediately go to the doctors at any sign of ill health. And so because they they don't let the uh, tuberculosis uh, fester for a little bit, it will actually make it more a chronic illness uh, and cause more damages to their body long term. He had no basis on this, but he just included it. But yeah, it's, so I, I think like, yeah, like I was saying, like in terms of the book, I found this part really interesting, um, but I don't think it actually really impacts one way or the other on um, if like what to how you should approach data and statistics and that sort of thing. It was like an interesting point, uh, but yeah, not the strongest one. Um, so one of the other things just quickly on this, sort of gone longer than I thought I would. Uh, so there was a replication crisis. Now he sort of attributes this to the whole problem that they just weren't Bayesian enough and that would solve the problem. Um, for those who don't know, there was basically a problem where, uh, the, like, uh, when uh, published res like scientific results were trying to be done, um, there was only like thirty six percent chance for psychology, a uh, sixty three percent and eleven percent of preclinical cancer studies uh, were uh, not able to be replicated, so it didn't perform very well. And one of the other points he makes is like that there were a lot of really wacky. Um, 
studies that were being done well, uh, oops, in uh, psychology, like around uh, ESP, like that people can predict things with their minds and that sort of thing, um, that this should actually cause into question the psychological methods, like research methods that were in place, that these could be shown to be successful. Like it should show, it should demonstrate uh, in the author's opinion that there was at that point like a problem within the psychological research methods. Now, I'll skip over this one because I've gone longer than I thought I would. Uh, oh, actually, yeah, just one point on this point. So one of the other things um, that he sort of goes on, which I think is one of the stronger points he makes, is that there sort of just needs to be this acceptance of subjectivity within um, within the understanding of statistics and probability. And that when they sort of got these uh, frequentists, and it's like, in the author's opinion, it comes a lot from these like so-called softer sciences, where they've got this lure of wanting the quantitative camouflage. They want to have that objectivity that we have the numbers to say this is true, but it's, it has a lot of problems within it with how uh, it works and like the results you get from it. Um, yeah, so I'll skip that. Yeah, so just my final thoughts on it. I yeah, I think like the book was really good. I would recommend it. Um, there, I'm not sure how I could apply it myself. So the, the author talks at the start of the book that he was like a PhD, he'd done all these statistics, he was going to talks, he was doing all that sort of stuff. But then he had to do, um, one of his mates wanted to do betting on basketball. And he was like, oh, yeah, I'm not actually sure how to do that. And so he kind of put together some things to do and they, they did all right, but he's not sure if he actually <laughs> knew what he was doing or not. And, and that's kind of how uh, I feel at the end of like, with reading this book, it's kind of like, yeah, like th there's a lot of things here, but don't really know how to apply that. Like it, it, it's sort of like there's more work, at least for myself with, um, with applying it. Um, but just to end with one last quote from it, because it links into the medical analogy. So I thought Courtney would enjoy that. Uh, probability can be the antidote. It reminds us, or perhaps provides the language with which we remind ourselves of the boundaries of our understanding. And it keeps us conscious of the fact that abundant data is not the same thing as knowledge. The era of big data must also therefore be an era of big probability. Thank you. Very good. I just wanted right, to yeah. ask, quickly um because there's a lot going on in that and not knowing yes. much about statistics it can be tricky i did statistics years ago and not at obviously your level but what about things like construct validity does that fit into what you're talking about because what i'm curious about obviously is um when you do psychometric testing for example you basically are setting up um um hyper hypotheses uh, around things that are just made up basically like personality profiles and things like that and then you set up some sort of um, construct validity where you can compare one scale against another scale in order to pr prove whether or not there's um, what you call I don't know presumably it's this kind of statistical relationship between the two if, if you appear to be measuring the same things therefore that thing must be real kind of idea um, but this is one of the key um, criticisms from the critical psych school against a lot of psychological testing is that you're using statistics in order to create the impression of hard sciences, but all you're doing is taking um, abstract theoretical concepts and then creating a false version of reliability around them and then measuring that thing that you've invented, you know? So this is kind of, part of that that critique around well what is mental illness what is a diagnostic category how do you measure it you know people can't be measured in these reliable ways for example yeah like so i i, put, I don't do much on well i don't do anything on psychology statistics and i imagine like there's a lot of skill in there but my thoughts on it like from this book is um when you've got say those like you know those personality um 
structures or constructs or whatever. It's like if you had if you had an exceptionally if you take like the Bayesian approach and you go, well, there's an exceptionally low probability that this is actually what personality is like. So if we get results that show this, this is how it works, we our probability of that actually be like the way we understand people, like that's just so far removed. We should just assume there's something wrong with the study or there's, there's some error that's occurred or just by chance you go on that outlier. Um, so that would be that sort of way there. But yeah, like what I have looked into around the personality tests, I find some of that stuff a bit questionable, but that's not really an area that I'm like, that I'm, I'm even a beginner at. Because if you think logically about it, say you give somebody a long lengthy questionnaire to fill out and if you've ever done one you realize how hard they are to answer because it's a Leichhardt scale often and it's like um well I don't know depends if you ask me on a good day or a bad day so part of the argument goes you're not actually measuring people's whatever it is you think you're measuring like extroversion or whatever what you're measuring is people's ability to fill out um, psychometric tests. Like literally, yeah. that's what you're measuring, you know? And like my understanding of the, the Leichhardt uh, scale is that you're basically taking that, uh, um, and you can correct me on this because I've only, I've only done a tiny bit on that, that um, you sort of adjust for the way that people are answering, because I think it's five scales that you, you traditionally use with that that you're then sort of adjusting that to how extreme they answer and you're sort of treating that as you sort of standardize that for that respondent. Is that about right with how that works? Oh, I'd say there's plenty of different ways in which they okay. skew, that skew their data to fit whatever they're trying to do with it. But this yeah. is the critique, like, you know, and, and I think it's an interesting point, like, I was trying to understand what you were talking about and I could only think of it in that psychological context. And that's a huge critique because they say, yeah, maybe if you could start out from the data and then derive from there um, ideas about what's going on, but you generally can't do that when you're talking about people, perhaps. Maybe you can in certain contexts, but maybe not if you're talking about abstract qualities like uh, whether they have psychopathy or not, for example. Yeah, it's not like you can, um, you know, attach like some measuring device or something and it's going to no. tell you there are nine out of ten happy. So You can't cut open their brain and, and look yeah. at it. Um, can I make, I just ask a question, Shannon? Because sure. uh, early on in, in the um, PowerPoint, you had a slide about, um, you know, the hypothesis arrow to the data and then the data arrow to the hypothesis. Yes. Um, and, you know, my understanding of this is <laughs> minimal to none, but isn't, isn't a hypothesis, starting with a hypothesis, isn't that, quotes, the scientific method? Yeah, so it would be, like, like it would be one view of the scientific method. Yeah, it is sort of majority. So he is, like, the Bayesian position, um, and, and, like, it's not just from reading his book, other people have read that there, there is like a sort of an uptake on this different approach towards statistics, um, but it is the minority position. So he is arguing against the majority. But can uh, I in, jump in, in the there? Yeah. My understanding of the scientific method after Popper is that um, you're seeking to falsify or to disprove the hypothesis. And that's what happens with these sometimes these statistical formulas. They set the hypothesis and then look for evidence to prove it. But the, the scientific method it goes the other way around. It's supposed to take uh, a creative um, kind of hypothesis and then, and it has to be weird enough and unlikely enough to actually be something you could possibly verify, but the purpose is to go and out of your way to disprove it. I think that's where the null hypothesis comes in too, as part of one of these things. Yeah, that, that was one of the things I sort of skimmed over because I realized I probably did have way too much in here. When you're, when you're writing the slides, it's like, oh yeah, I'm not going to have enough to go over 10 minutes. And then I think I went like, 20 minutes so sorry about that <laughs>
I, re I really wanted to see the flow chart. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I can show it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh. It'd be nice to, you know, it'd be, it'd be so sad to miss out on that little bit extra, Shannon, that you've gone to the work of um, preparing if it's uh, just no, a couple I, of minutes. I, I, yeah. I, I, I took this from the book, so this is not my, <laughs> not, not, I didn't make it, but the, yeah. yeah, so basically it has, so it's sort of the key parts here is like these end points. And so he's making this as a comparison between the Bayesian version and the frequentist version. So the frequentist version on the left side you can see it has all these different things that you do depending on what it is um now uh oh, no. have you shared your screen or not no. oh sorry i thought i had oh, no you're right apologies that might work a bit better <laughs> so the, the left side is the so this is the yeah commonly used to, this is the frequentist sort of understanding so this is like, um, so this is what I am more, I guess, like trained in. Or this is what I more understand. Um, Bayesian to me is is like something new. I'm sort of learning that outside of uni. Um, but it's basically like, okay, what's the type of data you have? And then these are the sort of tests that you can apply to it, depending on what it is. So is it continuous or discrete and categorical? So if it's discrete categorical, you can do the chi-square test. Yeah. Um, and then it goes like, okay, what's the relationship difference? Sort of goes down different mm -hmm. different paths, and, and then you sort of end up with these different different types of tests that you got to do. And his whole point is that, well, the adva advantage of the Bayesian the Bayesian way, there is one answer. It's the Bayesian theorem. <laughs> That's what you're doing. Everything is the Bayesian theorem. <laughs> that, that's it solves solves all the problems. Um, One thing I thought maybe a little bit dodgy, and and yeah. this might be stretching things, but since you like picking on Nussbaum, I'll pick pick on this guy. Sure. Um, it seemed to me that his, you know, and ironically so, that his attack on Pearson was a bit of an ad hominem fallacy. Yeah, I'd have to think more if it was, because I was probably presenting it like it was a little bit more than it probably is in the book. Um, but it does kind of feel like it is. Like, that that's my impression of it. Uh, so I don't I, I don't think you're wrong to draw that out from my presentation, because that's probably where I <laughs> towards it being. Or because it just feels like, yeah, OK, like, I, and I, I, I do really want to say, like, the history stuff there was really good. Like, it was really well written. Um, it's at, at least like from my my little understanding about that that area of history, like it's pretty representative and all that. But it does feel like he is kind of using it as like a bit of an ad hominem. So yeah, I I would agree. Um, but it it's sort of easy to forgive because it's like. <laughs> Or maybe I, I I enjoy the book, so it's easy to forgive because like it, it is just well, in my opinion, well written. Um, but yeah, it, it probably would be a part that if you're trying to be like more structured and like this is what I'm trying to argue for from like a more high academic level, it, it could be a bit better. One other point too, I'd, I'd say is like a bit of a weakness of the book is it does kind of feel like okay, like you're saying like these problems exist and it's like, yeah, like frequent, but th there are a lot of people that um, lack frequentist statistics, like not a small amount, <laughs> like it's the majority. Um, there are going to be responses to these things that he's saying and he doesn't really give any of those responses, at least it feels to me um, in the book. So yeah, but then again, like, like I said at the start, he does, he does say in the introduction, this is wartime propaganda. Like I am, I am, I am totally going to like rhetorically argue for my position. So yeah. Uh, Looking at- I, just, I may have, sorry, sorry, Courtney. I may have missed, but why does he do that? Why is he taking this polemical approach? 
because he views this as like a problem that's undermining the sciences that needs to be solved or otherwise we're going to end up with a, a lot more trash science um like another replication crisis um so he's like this needs to be sorted so I, I need to be as strong and like rhetorical as possible is sort of his position on this um yeah it i don't know it it's like because one part of me thinks like oh like it does it does sometimes like just undermine that little bit where you're like how far can I trust you? Like all these, even though you've, you've told me you're going to be a little bit rhetorical, like, and, and there's one part in it where um, he is like, he's presenting these um, different circumstances and he's like, oh, well, like, you know, some people would say that I've not actually used the correct frequentist test in these things and they are correct, but this just shows uh, that there's not like there's not a consistent logic there within the frequentist and it's like yeah I like I do actually kind of agree with you. like I don't know uh, I, I lean towards agreeing with the Bayesian position on the um, like I said it's not what I've studied at uni but when I read about it I'm like yeah like this kind of does address what my issues are with, with statistics but when he kind of is like yeah I've used the wrong test to show how wrong they are it's like <sighs> I, I think you would have been better showing the right ones and like getting with like why like okay he's like here's the right way of doing it but there's nothing logical uh, there's nothing um stopping you from doing it this way and that shows this tension here that exists or something i don't know it's just yeah some of it's a bit yeah that's why i had like the um i, I like it's partially a joke sort of thing but that, that's why i had like this um this slide because like this is kind of how he is writing within it. Like he is very, um, yeah, he's he's not, it, it's maybe like a little unfair towards him. He's not that harsh, but he gets kind of close. And I, and I feel like saying that ironically, he's coming at this with a fully formed hypothesis that the frequentists uh, are stupid and then he's looking for data to support it so he's actually doing what the frequentists are doing <laughs> but but you know i was also going to say that you you mentioned that um not everyone loves frequentist statistics but just looking at vincent's face i i find that hard to believe well i i i think i've got a couple of things to say am i muted oh bad luck for you guys i am not um I really think that it's a little simplistic to say the arrow goes one way or the other. So, like for instance, Courtney talked about um, scientists and using the not the frequentist, the other one, the scientific method, right? So they're coming at a whatever it's they're studying weather patterns or uh, some chemistry thing, whatever. They're looking at it and they've got a hypothesis formed. But where does that start? I think they would be observing patterns and thinking, oh yeah, actually, you know. There seems to be colder weather in July versus January. I wonder if there's something to that. So let's start with a let's take that observation and then make a hypothesis and like maybe that null hypothesis. So then you're going to disprove it. Either way, how would you come up with a hypothesis if you're not trying to notice any patterns emerging in the data? So that's yeah. what I really think that the arrow would go ideally. There's a small arrow going to the left and a bigger one. Where the evidence is is going the other direction yeah i think that's um, a, just saw that um just quickly like uh that was my error in the presentation i forgot to mention that he thinks the bayesian can actually do both so he's saying that the frequentist just has this hypothesis to data and yeah. that the bayesian uh, position can allow for both uh both approaches uh, to that I forgot to mention that with it. Yeah, and two other words fly in, which is induction and deduction, or deduction, sorry. And it's, uh, I'm not quite sure, but don't they marry up with the two different approaches you're talking about? From going from big to small or small to big? Um, <laughs> no, well, so, yeah. So you're saying that like the, the, 
the deduction would be the frequent. This would be deduction, wouldn't it? Uh, well, uh, I don't think it is because well, this is one of the things I sort of didn't, I, I sort of skimmed over, but like, because when you're doing the tests, like the null hypothesis test, uh, you have the um, null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis, and you have some um, percent that you're um, aiming that the test has to go over, like how unlike, uh, how odd the data is. Um, and that percentage, like making that decision of what percentage that should be, that's not a, there's nothing in the world that tells you that this 0.05% um, is this, that that should be the standard that's used. It's real, uh, like, like they say, uh, it has it in the book that basically, you know, the reason why it's used is because that's what the journals and uh, the editors of those journals accept. And the reason why they use it is because that's what Fisher and uh, Pearson used. <laughs> um, so, and, and there's not, like, it, it really is just vibes on that. Um, so, like, there, there is, like, some sense, though. I, I, don't, I don't want to completely, like, I, th I think like there is definitely some sense where it's kind of close, like that they are frequentist is deductive and Bayesian is inductive. Um, but I, I think there are little things that I see with, within frequentism, of, of, like the frequentist approach that would mean that it's not, it's not deductive. Okay. Um, two other things I wanted to say. One was that with the frequent, frequentist approach, if you are, have a means to actually um, capture all of the data, so you've got the entire population or whatever you want to call it, and then you can notice patterns in that, um, you know, if, like for instance, maybe it's like you have the entire data set for, I don't know, a particular city or state, whatever, and then it's life expectancy of women versus men's, for instance, all right? So you've got all the data on that, and then there's a pattern, which is women live on average longer than men. And how can you not come up with a conclusion there? This is maybe not a very good example, but that's certainly enabled now with technology whereby algorithms can take the entire um, amount of data and then they're just, there's just patterns that can be noticed by them or by us, you know? Um, yeah, so I don't know. It's... Uh, I just think you really, if you want to make a strong case for anything, you want to use both. And it seems as though the guy you're arguing for is more inclusive, although the zombie picture and some of your arguments mean to seem to kind of um, kick uh, frequentists out of the equation entirely, whereas I would think it's stronger to use both. But the fallacy would be over, over reliance on one or the other, potentially. Um, yeah, so on the, on the thing of like all the data, well, I, I, th I don't think we could ever have all of the data that we care about. Because when we say like we're looking at um, men and women, um, like what's their average time they die, and we have everyone was ever lived, or at least say everyone has ever lived for the last 2,000 years. We don't have everyone who's ever lived for the next 2,000 years. So we, are, we don't actually have all the, all the data. No, we, we all and like, like a census, you know, they try and mm -hmm. get the information on the population of a particular country, like how many people are living in this abode on this particular date, um, what's your religious orientation, what's your racial, it's not going to be 100% accurate, but they're trying to get pretty much everyone in there. And it stands to reason they can make some conclusions based on all the data that they collect, surely. Yeah, and that would be like the, well, I think both. Um, and I do, uh, let me just go to the point that I agree with. I do think like there is like, it, it makes me a little uncomfortable, but there is something within me where I see the the value of a pragmatic approach where you do have these both, these frequentist and the Bayesian positions. Now, like I said, in the book, he thinks that frequentist, uh, sorry, the Bayesian can do both, that they can both do the hypothesis to the data and data to the hypothesis. I'm not so sure he argues, like, the book is like, does have some technical parts. Um, 
but I don't think he really argues that completely. So I'm not fully on board with that. And so there is um, part of me that thinks of this pragmatic approach of having both, but it does feel a little icky because it's not really like, there's no consistency, there's no logic. I'm just saying on vibes, I like the idea of being able to use both of these tools. So I'm just going to keep using them. I don't really have like a, a there's, no cons there's no consistency within um, why I'm using one tool over the other. And, and there is something a little uncomfortable about that, but I'm also happy with it. So I don't know. Yeah. I think you are getting at a good point on that. Um, yeah. I wonder how we could yeah, statistically yeah. work out whether Shannon was going to use the tool, which tool or the other tool. <laughs> but on that note, it is getting late, guys. So maybe we should close it. Very interesting discussion. So well, thank you for surprising me. I've got Sorry? One. I've got a presentation. You're too late. <laughs> You'll have to wait for next time. <laughs> no. wait, can we do uh, it next know. time for Vincent's presentation? I That's think he's probably VR just in uh, Cambodia and in Kuwait. Yeah. Oh. Very good. So um uh wonderful. And actually I was really pleasantly surprised. They're all very interesting and different. So just shows you. I thought you guys would all be trying to do something on stoicism or epicureanism. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's been amazing and it's just a really good statement about our intellectual curiosity and varied interests as a group. So thanks everybody. Yeah. Thanks guys. Bye bye. I want to say yeah. one more one more thing, closing remark. Yeah. Um going back to that um sort of um brisk conversation between Ashley and Judith on Automons, um, there's this meaningful quote which goes something like simple people talk about other people more uh, intellectually or enlightened that they talk about events and then the height of that is talking about ideas and so from my own personal experience you think about things like gossip that's quite common and yet that is fairly simplistic sort of um, thinking in a sense um, whereas I think what this group is all about is that high that third tier not to speak, not to say that events and people, and most in our case, mostly it's dead philosophers, don't feature in the talks, but that it does gravitate towards ideas. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's necessarily typical for a lot of people. I would think that they're talking more about events and, and people they know. Um, maybe not so much ideas, but could be wrong. You know, hopefully that's the case. So yeah. Mm, thanks for sharing that. It's very nice. All right, guys, take it easy. Cool. Good night. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks, everyone. See you soon. See ya.